passive house standard is an energy, a building energy efficiency standard um, that is focused on making the building envelope super efficient. Uh, there's a lot of uh, building rating systems that um, are looking at uh, everything from the electricity consumption. Uh, a lot of the DOE programs are actually basically um, encouraging people to throw solar panels on conventional construction and calling that a zero energy home. Well, uh, that is not really the best way to go about things because uh, photovoltaics are still rather inefficient. So um, this standard came from Europe, uh, developed over 20 years ago. There are now uh, over 20,000 worldwide. Um, I missed the conference this year, so I don't have the exact numbers because I was too busy building. Um, it was developed by Wolfgang Feist in Germany. Uh, Katrin Klingberg has uh, brought it here to the United States, and she's the uh, first U.S. passive house planner. And uh, I'm the first uh, certified passive house consultant in Michigan, but not the last, <laughs> thank goodness. Um, so there's some websites that you can get more information from. And if you go to either of my two websites there, the bottom one is actually for our house project that we're building. Uh, you'll find links to the Prezi presentations. So there's this short version for this, and there's also the longer version that has um, more photos in it, as well as an uh, older Prezi that covers how to retrofit to the passive house standard. So the two projects I'm talking about today are actually um, new construction, but you can retrofit houses, and there's a, probably a lot more interest in that. Uh, so I apologize for not being able to answer your, your questions about, uh, cover your, your interest in that in this talk here today. Um, what you're trying for is basically the lowest life cycle cost. That's kind of the point of the passive house standard is how can we affordably make the building envelope so good that you can actually start to drop out some of the costs of the most expensive mechanical systems. Um, and uh, it's important to actually start the design process with the energy calculations instead of having them being done after the fact. Um, so that uh, is important not only for uh, proper sizing of the mechanical systems so the house works, but also so that you get uh, the best building durability um, involvement. And the, the logo over there at the right is the logo of the Passive House uh, Institute US, and that would be on certified uh, passive houses, and um, certified consultants are entitled to use it too. Oh, that didn't, okay. Next. So this is one of my clients. Um, this is uh, Gaia Kyle, is standing against the corner of his house there. Uh, he is an owner builder, and uh, he even wanted to do a lot of his own drawings, um, but he did ask me to um, work with him on some of the construction detailing for his house and also give recommendations for energy efficiency. So this house is one where we haven't actually done the energy calculations because it couldn't be a passive house because it's actually on the north side of his existing home. So it doesn't have sufficient solar gain to be treated as a passive house in its own right. Um, and it can't be, the combined building can't be a passive house until they get around to renovating the existing building. So what we were shooting for was to try to um, make the building envelope good enough so that it could, the whole building could be brought to the passive house standard in the future without having to redo the addition. And um, also so that, uh, what we were hoping for is that the existing furnace could handle much more square footage, uh, basically be able to handle the, uh, the, the new addition because the heat losses through the old walls of the house would be very close to what the heat losses through the entire addition would be. So, um, so I mentioned um, that the point of the passive house standard is to try to find that economic sweet spot. Um, and that's what they've accomplished in Europe, or we're still not quite there here in the United States because our, we don't have all of the um, 
building uh, systems, mechanicals, uh, super efficient um, components that are needed yet, and so they're very, still very pricey and a lot of them still have to be imported for, from Europe. But as we uh, start to develop our uh, own versions of these super efficient systems, we think we'll be able to kind of replicate their success. So on the far right hand side, you'll see that represents, the vertical line represents where the code would be. And um, as you move horizontally across the graph, uh, you're lowering your heating energy. So you can see the heating energy is going down linearly. Well, the cost is also kind of going up exponentially. And then you come to the point of the passive house standard here, and you can, uh, at that point, you get the building envelope so efficient that you can drop out the furnace, the boiler, uh, and basically heat the house with just the, the minimum amount of ventilation air that's required. And so at that point, you can bring the cost, the total cost, back down into the range of what you might be paying for a conventional house. Oops. So uh, I always try to start the projects with a solar site assessment. If uh, passive house, certified passive houses are all passive solar houses. The requirement for the sun is an essential part of it here. So the two red vertical lines there are representing 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. Uh, th this device is, is um, oriented south and you can see white lines that represent the path of the sun on the 21st day of each month of the year. Um, oh boy. <laughs> uh, I need to get a power supply. It's in my bag there. Yeah. So I may put the top down here to let it rest for a moment while, oh, you got one. Uh, good. All right. <laughs> These little things, my battery's getting tired in its old age. Um, so we've, uh, with the, um, Pass of the sun for each day of the year. So basically, you would like to, to, in the reflection of the sky there, not see any obstacles crossing between those red lines uh, and have a good solar window. And here there are numerous deciduous trees that um, would cause a problem for their existing home. Um, but uh, when they get up to the, th the top of the third story, uh, they will actually have some windows um, where they will get some solar gain into the addition. Okay, so these are my drawings of their party wall, and uh, this is kind of the, the key doc drawing that shows where all the details go. So um, we're basically looking at how to put together the building in such a way that we can maintain air tightness of the new addition and make sure that we've got an expansion joint so the two buildings um, don't cause problems cracking each other up. When, if you try to add a new building onto an old building without an expansion joint, you, they can actually do damage to each other. So um, that was why I was asked to be involved in the party, uh, party wall detailing. Um, so I'm including one picture here of a detail, which was that gray circle at the top left, uh, where the um, addition this is a detail from the uh, addition where the eaves are meeting the, the party wall of the house, except here the uh, wall of the addition on the south is actually sticking up above the existing building. But I was uh, put this in here so you can see the importance of maintaining a continuous air barrier. So um, the, this house was constructed with um, a two by four uh, structure uh, partly because that would be something that the code officials would be very comfortable with. So it's framed like a conventional two by four building. And then the outside of that is um, air sealed, which is uh, sheets of plywood are, are put um, over the entire outside of the building, including between these two, uh, the old and the new building, and all the joints are taped. So we're getting a continuous air barrier. That's what that red line represents. You want to know where that is going through the building. And um, then the, we are wrapping the building with more insulation on the outside of that air barrier. 
So the two by four structure, all of the utilities, electrical and everything can run inside of that two by four structure and it nominally is providing the structure for the building and keeping the code officials happy, but actually there's um, more structure on the outside of that that is, is uh, the framing for the uh, insulation. <coughs> and um, so in this case, uh, the, we were using some uh, polyisocyanurate cyanurate boards on this wall because we needed to keep this wall as thin as possible since it was um, the party wall and we don't have the dimension, uh, as much space for the uh, thickness of the wall since we had some clearance issues with the existing uh, chimney and, and keeping clear of a certain distance from that. Um, so this is the, that detail would be in the top right hand corner where that south wall with the windows is meeting the roof. That's where that was drawn. Um, and here is um, the third floor of the building. Uh, Guy is quite happy with this space. Um, they don't have any heating supplied to this space yet, but even with it under construction and not completely sealed, it's already um, one of the warmest, most comfortable spaces in their house and just flooded with daylight this time of the year. And um, uh, they added the narrow window there. When they got up that high, they discovered they had a great view, so they actually added a window so that they could have a view of the downtown. Um, so he's absolutely thrilled with this space. Um, in this drawing, you can see where that uh, plywood air barrier is coming in, and they still have to uh, return the, the t ceiling tape to the window frames and, and make that continuous. Um, um, in most of the window details, so this is on the second floor in a bedroom, uh, most of the window details were actually putting the windows uh, in line with that air barrier. It just makes the air sealing details a lot simpler. Uh, with the south windows, we tend to push them uh, towards the outside edge of the wall thickness. Uh, it gives you nice window seat inside, but it also means that the edges of the opening are not shading the glass. Um, and then we use external shading devices to, sh to shade in the summertime, over, usually horizontal overhangs. Um, in the west, east, and north sides, we tend to put the windows in the middle of the wall, and that way the, thickness, the wall thickness itself can help to shade those windows from uh, summer heat gain. In this case, they flared the opening so that they could have a view of, their, of the neighbor house, which is also a cooperative community that they're part of. So it's, they're good buddies next door. Um, uh, here you can see from the outside of the house, there's uh, small windows on the east side of the building. Um, and again, they're, I'm keeping them narrow so that the, the thickness of the wall itself can protect it from summer overheating. Um, and in the uh, dining room on the first floor, um, they really wanted to have a bay window with a window seat, but um, to avoid having higher uh, heat loss, we actually used um, a smaller window that's flush with the outside surface of the wall, and we flared the opening on the inside, which helps to spread the light um, more into the room, give the effect of a bay window with a window seat, but actually having the lower heat loss um, with that north-facing window. Um, okay. The rest of the house, with the exception of that south wall above the existing building, is um, on the outside of that air barrier layer. Uh, they constructed uh, Larson trusses, which is basically um, using dimensional lumber. Uh, Guy has salvaged huge quantities of lumber over the years, and so he was able to make up his own Larson trusses um, using conventional dimensional lumber, and then uh, putting plywood cords um, at intervals up the length of, of these uh, trusses that uh, give it the proper depth and rigidity to, to the uh, 
framing members. And then these are actually serving as the studs on the outside of the house, and they give you a lot of depth for putting that extra insulation in. Um, and so here we've got um, some of the uh, features that I've, when I've done passive house calculations for several clients now, um, I'm coming in for southern Michigan at about an R60 uh, for the roof and the walls. Um, and th I should preface this with saying it varies entirely from house to house, but if you have a simple building envelope, like it's a simple rectangle, very compact shape, um, this is what I'm, I'm coming in with results for. If you do a gerrymander and have a really sprawling shape, uh, you're going to need a lot more insulation. Um, and uh, so these are, these are some of the values that we're trying for with the passive house. Um, the air tightness is one of the most critical features, and uh, that is a non-negotiable. If you don't get it below uh, 0.6 air changes per hour at, at uh, 50 pascals of pressurization or depressurization with the blower door, then it's not a passive house. Um, but to give you an idea of what that means, um, the code requirement is 0.35 air changes per hour. If you drop below that level uh, of air leakage in a building, you're required to have mechanical ventilation. Well, the, the uh, value for the passive house um, actually comes in at about a 20th of that uh, minimum code requirement. So it's getting to a very low level of building air leakage, and it's kind of like you're trying to build a balloon. Um, but the benefits of that means that uh, now you, that you're using mechanical ventilation in the form of a heat recovery ventilator, you can actually have all of the fresh air that you need for building health and not throw away the heat that's contained in that air. Um, so the, um, the mechanical systems, we still have a mechanical system, but instead of a furnace, it's now a heat recovery ventilator. Um, the ducts are much smaller instead of really big ducts, two to each room, supply and return. Now we have a single duct system, which is either a supply or a return duct to each room, and they're about three inches in diameter. Um, and you put that HRV inside the building en envelope. You don't have to have all the heat losses through the ductwork system then. You can also have much shorter duct runs because since you've got a super insulated envelope, um, you don't have the uh, problems with um, heat loss through the, through the uh, walls and the comfort level is much better. So um, we also make use of air admittance valves, recirculating hoods, and an induction cooktop, um, and condensing dryer, all, all of the things that we are taking a lot of the air losses out of the building. Um, so here is the um, components of the HRV with uh, insulation on the ducts. Um, this small device here is, the, uh, is a, an electric heater that's capable of heating an entire house, and it's, it fits into a six-inch duct, the main six-inch supply duct to the building. So. Um, so this is uh, some photos from our project, my husband standing in the excavation. It's probably the first uh, earth-sheltered um, passive house, in, certainly in Michigan, if not the nation. Um, so the, wow, part of the drawing, oh, it's all there. The, the rectangular area on the right-hand side is the passive house parts. The rest of it is unconditioned storage. And uh, it's completely earth sheltered on the north and west sides, um, up to 14 foot of uh, dirt on those sides. And then on the south and east sides, uh, there are egress windows from the basement. Um, and uh, we have two floors with a loft on the south side, so three levels of windows. And the sun comes all the way in. And it's built out of 16 inch thick glass fiber reinforced concrete panels. Um, which I have samples you can look at out there in the hallway during the open time. Uh, putting an electrical conduit. Um, 
Here are our, our foundations. We've got a gravel drainage plane underneath the plastic that is connected up to the perimeter foundation drains and will also be connected to a vertical drainage plane ar around the outside of the building basement walls. Um, here we're putting some gravel in the areas where we don't have bearing walls that require thicker foundations. So we get, we're uh, pouring the concrete here um, and we'll have a, we have a continuous structural slab that's supporting the building. Um, this is a mock-up that's out in the hallway there uh, showing how, some, how the electrical and um, plumbing go, go into the building and all of that stuff is being coated okay, um, uh, behind all the electrical and plumbing because that interior coating is our air barrier and needs to be continuous so um, we actually have no air leakage um, even through the electrical boxes which is a problem with all conventional construction. So I'm being told that I'm out of time so I better uh, wrap up here and I don't I probably don't have time for questions but uh, the presentations are on the internet both the short version what's left of it that I haven't showed you and the longer version that it came from and the um, you can access them through the links on my website and also the one about retrofits so thank you for your time I wish I had